Hello, people. I am going to be reading the book Ready Player One, Chapter One, uh, with the, um, <clears throat> in the middle of it. This is part two. Let me just get to the page. Should have put in a bookmark. Okay. Above them were suspended on a reinforced module, modular scaffold a have a haphazard and hazard metal lattice work. Sorry, that had been constructed constructed piece piecemeal over the years. We lived in Portland Avenue. We lived in the Portland Avenue stacks. A sprawling hive of discolored, discolored, sorry, I lost where I, where, I, where I was, discolored tin shoeboxes resting on the shores of I-40, just west of Oklahoma City's decaying scraper core, skyscraper core. It was a collection of over 500 individual stacks all connected by each other all connected to each other by a makeshift network of, re of recycled pipes griders support beams and foot bridges the, the spires of a dozen ancient construction cranes used to do the actual stacking in parentheses were no, used to do actual stacking, that's in parentheses, sorry. We're, we're, we're po positioned, or oh, sorry, around the stack, ever expanding outer perimeter. The top level or roof of the stacks was blanketed with a patchwork array of solar panels that provide supplemental power to the units below. A bundle of horses and corrugated, tumbling, tubbing snakes up and down the side of each stack, supplying water to each trailer and carrying away sewage. In parentheses, luxury, luxuries, not luxuries, not available in some of the other stacks scattered around the city. Very little sunlight at the bottom level. In parentheses again, known as the floor, <laughs> the dark, narrow strips of ground between the stacks were clogged with skeletons of abandoned cars and trucks. Their gas tanks impeded, impeded. I don't know. In their exit route, blocked off long ago. One of our neighbors, Mr. Miller once explained to me that a trailer park like ours had originally consisted of a few dozen mo mobile homes arranged in neat rows on the ground. But after oil crashed, the onset of the energy cri crisis, large cities had been flooded with refugees surrounding, surrounding suburban and rural areas resulting in a massive ur massive urban housing storage real estate within walking distance of the city became too far too valuable to waste on a, a flat plain of mobile homes so someone had to cook up a brilliant idea idea of as mr miller put it put it in quote unquote stacking the the sumpages To maximum the use of ground space, the idea caught on it uh, on in a big way, and and trailer park caught the idea caught on in a big way, in trailer parks across the country, had quickly evolved into sacks like this one, strange hybrids of sandy towns squatter settlements in refugee camps.
they were now scattered around the outs outskirts of most major cities, each one overflowing with uprooted rednecks like my parents, who were desperate for work, food, electricity, electricity and reliable oasis access. As fled their dying small towns, and as used as the last of their gasoline, or their beast of burden, to haul, or their beast of burden, in parentheses, to haul their families, RVs, and trailer homes to the the nearest metropol metropolis. Every stack in our park stood at least 15 mobile homes high, with, in parentheses, sorry, I have to tell y'all this, in parentheses, with the occasional RV shipping container, Airstream tra trailer, or with, or VW microbus mixed in for variety. <coughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit sick. In recent years, many of the stacks have grown to a height of 20 units or more. This made a lot of people nervous. Stack collapses weren't, weren't that uncommon. And if the scaffold supports buckled at the wrong angle, the domino effect could breathe out, bring down four or five of the neighboring stacks, too. Our trailer wasn't near the northern edge of the stacks. We ran up to a crumbling highway overpass. From my vantage point at the laundry room, I, I could see a thin stream of electric vehicles crawling along the crack cracked as asphalt carrying goods and workers into the city as i started out at the grim skyline the bright silver of the sun peeked over the horizon watching it wise i performed a mental ritual whenever i saw the sun i reminded myself that i was looking for i was looking at a star one over hundreds and billions of stars in our galaxy. A galaxy that was just one of the billions of other galaxies in the observable universe. This helped me keep things in perspective. I started doing it after watching sci a science program from the early 80s called Cosmos. I slipped out of the window as quickly as possible. And clutching the bottom of the window frame slid down the co cold surface of the trailer M trailers metal sliding the steel platform on which the trailer rested was only slightly wider and longer than the trailer itself leaving a ledge about a foot and a half wide all the way around I carefully lowered myself until my feet rested on its ledge. Then reach up to a closed window behind me. I grabbed hold of the rope. I strung there at waist level to serve a, as a hand hold and began to sidestep along the ledge to the corner of the platform. From there, I was able to descend the ladder-like frame of scaffolding. I almost took the, I almost always took this route when leaving and returning to my aunt's trailer. A rickety metal staircase was bolted to the side of the stack, but it shook and knocked against the scaffolding so I couldn't use it without announcing my pres presence. Bad news in the stack. It was best to avoid being heard or seen whenever possible. There were often dangerous and desperate people about the sort who would rob you, rape you, and then sell your organs on the black market. Descending the network of metal girders had always reminded me of old platform video games like Donkey Kong or Burger Time. I seized upon this idea a few years earlier when I coded my first Atari. 2600 game parentheses a gun to write a passage like a jedi building his first sliced lightsaber hmm. 
it was a pitfall rip off called the stacks where you had to navigate through a vertical maze of trailers collecting junk computers snagging food voucher power-ups snagging food and then this is the voucher power-ups and avoiding meth addicts and pedophiles on your way to school my game was a lot more fun than the real thing as i climbed down i paused next to the airstream trailer three units below ours where my friend mrs gilmore lived she was a sweet old lady in her mid-70s she always seemed to get up ridiculously early I peeked in her window and saw her snuffling around her kitchen making breakfast. She spotted me after a few seconds and her eyes lit up. Wade, she said, cracking open her window. Good morning, my dear boy. And, then she, and he said, good morning, M Mrs. G, I said. I hope I didn't startle you. Not at all, she said. She pulled her robe tight against the ja her ro yeah, rope or robe, tie it against the draft coming in the window. It's freezing out there. Why don't you come in and have some breakfast? I got some soy bacon, and these powder eggs aren't too bad if you put, if you just put enough salt on them. Thanks, but I can't this morning, Mrs. G. I have to get to school. All right. Rain checked in. She blew me a kiss and started to close the window. Try not to break your neck climbing around there, okay, Spider-Man? Will do. See you later, Mrs. G. I waved goodbye to, to her and continued my descent. Mrs. Gilmore was a total sweetheart. She let me crash on her couch when I needed to, although it was hard for me to sleep because of her cats. Mrs. G was super religious. She spent most of her time in the oasis sitting in the congregate I don't know, one of those big online mega churches singing hymns, sing, listening to sermons, and taking virtual tours of the Holy Land. I fixed her ancient oasis console whenever it went on the fritz, and in return she answered my endless questions about what, what it had been like for her to grow up in, during the 1980s. She knew the coolest bits of 80s trivia. Stuff you couldn't learn from books or movies. She was always praying for me too. Trying her hardest to save my soul. I never had the heart to tell her that I thought organized religion was a total crop. It was, ple it was a pleasant fantasy that gave her hope and kept her going which was exactly what the hunt was for me. To quote the almanac, people who live in glass houses who should shut the F up. When I reached the bottom level, I jumped off the scaffold and dropped the few remaining feet to the ground. My rubber boots crunched into the slush and frozen mud. It was still pretty dark down here. So I took my flashlight and headed east, weaving my way through the dark maze. Doing my best to remain unseen be, while being careful to avoid tripping over a shopping cart, engine block, or one of those other pieces of junk littering the narrow out, alleys between the stacks. I rarely saw anyone out at this time of the morning. The com commuter shuttles ran yeah, commuter. I thought it was computer. It's commuter. The commuter shuttles on, ran only a few times a day. So the residents lucky enough to have a job. So, so the residents are lucky enough to have a job. Would already be waiting at the bus stop by the highway. Most of them work as day laborers in the giant factory farms that surround the city. After walking about a half a mile, I reached a giant mound of old cars and trucks piled haphazardly, ha hazardly, I don't know, 
along the stack's eastern perimeter. Decades ago, the cranes had cleared the park of as many abandoned vehicles as possible to make room for even more stacks. They've dumped them in huge piles like this one all around the settlement's perimeter. Many of them were nearly as tall as the stacks themselves. I walked to an edge of a pile and after a quick glance around to make sure I wasn't being watched or followed, I turned side to side. <coughs> sorry, sorry. I turned sideways to squeeze through the gap between two crushed cars. From there, I ducked, clambered, and sidestepped my way farther and farther into the ramshackle uh, mountain of twist metal until I reached a small open space where, at the rear of a car, bur buried cargo van. Only the rear of a third van was visible. The rest was concealed by other vehicles stacked on and around it. Two over the turnip pickup trucks lay across the van route roof at different angles, but most of their weight was supported by the cars stacked on either side, creating a kind of protective arc that prevented the van from wait, that prevented the van from being crushed by the mountain of vehicles piled above it. I pulled out a chain I kept around my neck a chain that I kept around my neck, on which there hung a single key and a stroke of luck. This key had been hanging from the van's ignition when I first discovered it. Many of these vehicles had been in working condition when they were abandoned, but the owners had had simply no longer been a able to afford fuel for them, so they just parked them and walked away. I pocketed my flashlight and unlocked the van's rear right door. I opened it about a foot and a half, just giving it me enough room to squeeze inside. I pulled the door closed behind me and locked it again. The rear van's rear doors had no windows, so I was hunched over in total darkness for a second until my fingers found the old power strip I duct taped to the ceiling. I flipped it on, and an old desk lamp flooded the tiny space with light. The crumpled green roof of a compact car covered the crushed cover crushed opening where the windshield had been but damaged to the van's front end didn't extend beyond the cab. The rest of the interior remained intact. Someone had to remove all the van seats in parentheses probably used as furniture. I'm leaving a small room about four feet wide, four feet high, and, and nine feet long. This was my hideout. I discovered it four years earlier while searching for discarded computer parts when I first opened the door and glazed into the van's darkened interior. I knew right away I found something of inserable value and privacy. This was a place no one else knew about where I wouldn't have to worry about getting hassled or slapped around by my aunt or whoever, whatever she, or or whatever loser she was currently dating, I could keep my things here without worrying they'd be stolen. And most important, it was a place where I could access the oasis in peace. And the van was refuge, my back cave, my fortress of solitude. It was where I attended school, did my homework, read books, watched movies, and played video games. It's also where I conducted my ongoing quest to find a holiday's Easter egg. I covered the walls, floors, ceiling with styrofoam eggs, styrofoam egg cartons, and pieces of carpeting in effort to soundproof the van as much as possible. Several cardboard boxes, boxes of bus laptops and computer parts sat in the corner next to the rack of old car batteries and modified exercise bikes. I rigged up I'd rigged up as a recharger. Or yeah. Uh next to sorry I'm gonna read this again. Next to a rack of old car batteries with a modified exercise bike I had rig up rigged up as a recharger. Only the furniture was folding 
was a folding lawn chair. I dropped my backpack, strugged off my cloak, and hope, uh, hoped on the exercise bike. The charging batteries were usually only physical exercise I got each day. I pilled until the meter says the batteries had full charge, then sat down in the chair and switched on the small electric heater I keep beside I kept beside it. Pulled off my gloves and rubbed my hands in front of the filaments as they began to glow bright orange. I couldn't leave the heater on for very long. It would drain the batteries. I had opened the rat proof metal box where I'd kept my food cat catchy cash I guess that's what it is, are you? It's C A C H E. It took out some bottled water and a packet of powdered milk. I mixed these together in a bowl and dumped, uh, dumped in a generous serving of fruit rock, rock cereal. <coughs> Once I wolfed it down, I retrieved an old plastic Star Trek lunchbox I kept hidden under the vans crushed dashboard inside were my school to issue oasis console haptic gloves and visor these items were by far the most valuable things i've owned far far too valuable to carry around me around with me i pulled off the my elastic haptic gloves pulled on my elastic haptic gloves and flexed my fingers to make sure none of the joints was sticky, sticking. Then I grabbed my Oasis console, a flat black rectangle about the size of a paperback book. It had a wireless network antenna built to it, but the reception inside the, the van was for us, since I buried it under a huge amount of dense metal, metal. So I rigged up the internal antenna, mounted it to the roof, and mounted it onto a hood of a car on top of the junk pile. The antenna cable snaked up the hole, through a hole I punched in the van ceiling. I plugged it into a port on the side on the side of the console. Then slipped on my visor. It fits snugly around my eyes, like a pair of swimmer's goggles, blocking out all the external light. Small earbuds extended from the vi visor's temples and automatically plugged themselves into my ears. The visor also housed two built-in stereo voice microphones to pick up everything I said. I powered on the console and imitated the login sequence. I saw a brief flash of red as the visor scanned my retinas. Then I cleared my throat and said my login passed Raised, being careful to in the jury. You have been recruited by a Star League to defend the frontier against Exer in the Code Codan Armada. My phrase was also verified with along with my voice pass pattern, and then I was logged in. The following text appeared to sub suppermost in the center of my virtual display. Identity verification was successful. Welcome to the Oasis, Parzival. Login completed. 07, and then, I guess this is a time date, but we may not really need that. It was February 10th, 2045. As the text faded, as the text faded away, it replaced by a short message, just three words long. This message had embedded in the lost login sequence by James Holiday himself when he first programmed the Oasis as a homage to the simulation's direct ancestors, the coin operated video games of its youth. These three words were also the last thing on Oasis, the last thing an Oasis usher saw before leaving the real world and entering the virtual one. And it said, Ready Player One. That was chapter one. Next is chapter two. Thank you for watching this video. And I will read chapter two in the next one.